Good evening. Good evening. A little better. No enthusiasm, though. One more time. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Much better. Um, thank you, as always, for coming out tonight. Welcome. Um, any people, new people here? Everybody been in the library before? So you all know that the bathrooms are down the hallway to the right there, and that our programs are being live streamed on Facebook and YouTube, so you can always watch them afterward, or if you're going to miss one of the upcoming uh, three left in the series, that you can watch that online. And and everybody, of course, knows that they, they're going to have to sil silence their cell phones, so they've already done that because they're all very responsible, respectful people. I have to catch myself because I'm not sure if I've done it, but I will do that after I finish introducing. Um, so tonight we're at the 50 yard line, so to speak, for the Winter Lecture Series, and that would have worked a lot better next week when we have uh, Ohio Valley Sports Legends. But uh, that's not how the schedule felt tonight, so I'll just keep that one in the caboose, uh, as opposed to the goalpost. <laughs> With all you know, serious things, though, um, scheduling this series every year is a lot of work, and the library is incredibly grateful to have this partnership with Great Stone Viavet uh, Society, which enables us to bring in these programs every February and March. And I said this last week, but I can't stress it enough. Uh, we couldn't keep doing this without your support and your attendance, so thank you again for being here tonight. And now to keep things rolling along, Stay on the train team. I'm going to pass the mic to Great Stone Weather by that board member Erica Keller to tell you a little about uh, a little bit more about tonight's speaker. Thank you so much, and thank you, Erin, for putting me on the right track. Uh, every teacher loves a good pun. We just love this. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. We're always so happy that you guys can come out and, and hang out with us in, in February and March. We look forward to this all year, and uh, we love bringing new programs each time, and um, you're in for a wonderful treat tonight. We are very lucky tonight to have Dwight Jones with us this evening, and um, uh, the Great Stone Viaduct was very lucky to meet Dwight and, and form a partnership with Dwight, and we're just very glad that he could be with us tonight. Um, a little bit about Mr. Jones. Um, uh, Mr. Jones developed an interest in the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad in 1967 in his hometown of Oak Hill, Ohio, in Jackson County. He witnessed the B&O locals arriving to switch local industries from both Chillicothe and Portsmouth, offered rides in the engine with the local crews, and solidified his interest in the railroad. After getting his driver's license, he was able to extend his coverage of the B&O facilities further from home. Continuing over the next several decades, he routinely traveled to every part of the 13th state b &O system, photographing cabooses, engines, and other miscellaneous items, resulting in a collection today of over 200, or no, sorry, two, th let's do it again, sorry, <laughs> one quarter of a million images. <laughs> His research and photography has resulted in the production of, and he corrected me, 23 books, but the potential of seven more to come. And dozens of articles, as well as various speaking engagements across the system. Specializing in caboose history, his goal was to photograph every caboose the BO has ever had. This goal was accomplished in the mid 1980s at a time when the railroad had over 600 cabooses in service. He also tracked down and photographed every BO diesel locomotive of this period the only person who have accomplished these feats. Mr. Jones owns five cabooses, two of which are original B&O types, with a third painted to represent a B&O car. He belongs to several railroad historical societies, the Hawking Valley Scenic Railway, and has served as a consultant to the B&O Railroad Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. He recently retired from a 50-year career in engineering and management in the aerospace, consumer products, automotive, and computer services area. He resides in Columbus, Ohio, and is looking forward to producing more railroad history books and articles. 
Um, and also, Mr. Uh, Jones was so kind as to donate uh, an entire collection of his books to the Blair Public Library this evening. So they will be available if you would like to check them out. So that was wonderful. And really, really appreciate that so much. So without further ado, um, when everyone is here for tonight, I'd like to introduce Mr. Dwight Jones. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for coming out tonight to see this uh, show that I put together. Uh, this is probably uh, about the 23rd show that I've done. This is a brand new show. And just to get started, uh, do we have anybody in the audience who would consider themselves to be a railroad buff? Just raise your hand. Yeah, we have uh, a couple of people here. Well, I kind of anticipated that most of the audience would be what I call general public. And so the program that I put together tonight is more of a general public type of a program. Uh, usually I talk about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half on one particular subject, but that's just for B&O fans. Uh, for general public, I have broken it up. And I would like to say that I have watched the past three weeks of live programs. It's been pretty interesting. Uh, one thing I noticed is that they show the presenter, they do a good job of showing the slides, but they never show the audience. So for those people who are tuned in tonight, watch the live, who can't see the audience, uh, I'm not used to getting a standing ovation, so I appreciate that. But uh, if you all would take your seats now, then we can uh, go ahead and do the rest of the program. You know, this is kind of like a Donald Trump uh, type of a program tonight. There's literally thousands and thousands of people standing outside that couldn't get in tonight. So uh, really appreciate those of you who were able to come in and, and get a seat tonight. You know, they always say you should start a program with a joke, and I had a joke that I brought with me, and I told it to a couple of people beforehand to kind of fill them out, and they, they kind of approved the joke, but uh, still I'm a little bit iffy about whether I should tell the joke or not, because it is just slightly racy, and I have cleaned it up a little bit. So uh, I think I, even though they told me I could go ahead and tell the joke, I think I'm gonna pass on telling the joke. I, I seem to uh, witness some dissent from the audience about telling the joke. So, uh, okay, fine. I've, I've been talked into it. I'll, I'll tell you the joke. Um, one person I told it to tonight said he'd already hold the joke, heard, heard the joke. And that's the bad thing about telling a joke. You just like the people have never heard the joke before. So anyway, they say that the joke should pertain to your subject matter. So this is a joke about a young man and I'm going to say he was a B&O employee, so therefore it ties in with tonight's program. And this young man had been dating a girl. He had been dating her for some time, and they were getting along really fantastically. And he had a date coming up this coming Friday night. And he really felt that the date on Friday night was going to be one of those dates that young men look forward to. He kind of felt that he was going to have a really good time Friday night, if you catch my drift. And so he wanted to be properly prepared for that. So he went to the local pharmacy and he looked up the pharmacist and he explained the situation to the pharmacist and said, I would like to purchase some of those things that a young man might want to purchase if he was going to be lucky on a, on a special day. And so the pharmacist uh, took his job very, very seriously. He uh, explained everything to the young man, the steps and all this and lectured him on the pros and cons, and, uh, and after a long discussion, the pharmacist sold him the things that he wanted. And so with the big day coming on Friday night, his girlfriend called him and said, uh, why don't you come over and have dinner with the family tonight? Uh, Mom's going to cook a really good meal, it's going to have all the fixings, fantastic table. And the young man thought, boy, this this will be just absolutely great. Uh, I won't even have to take my girlfriend out and buy her dinner. I get a free dinner. And so the young man came over that Friday night and he met the family and all this. And the young man says, do you mind if I say grace? And the family says, well, no, that'd be fantastic. You can say grace. 
And so uh, he started in the most fantastic grace that you've ever heard, but he just kept going on and on and on and on to the point that finally his girlfriend reached over and touched him on the arm and said, we didn't realize you were so religious. And the young man says, I didn't realize your father was the pharmacist. <laughs> You know, I, I went online and I read about telling a joke, and one of the rules was if you're going to tell a joke, it has to be a laugh out loud joke. It can't be one of those where you just roll your eyes like, oh yeah, that was, that was funny. Uh, I remember many years ago, back in college, I took a speech class, and I'll never forget what the uh, professor said. He said, if you're going to be doing a presentation, you should do three things. Number one, you should tell your audience what it is that you're about to tell them. Number two, you should then tell your audience what you just told them that you were going to tell them. And finally, you should conclude by telling your audience what it is that you just told them. So I thought that was a little bit funny, and I've, I've never forgot that. So they asked me, they said, what, what's the subject matter of your program tonight? And I said, it's going to be vegan au potpourri, and that's all I'm telling you. I'm not telling you anything else. Well, when, when they made the flyer for the show tonight, it says cabooses in big gigantic letters and vegan au potpourri in little tiny letters along the bottom. So I guess I can, I can take the hint. They want to hear a few things about, about cabooses. So... What am I going to talk about tonight? Well, here's, uh, here's the potpourri. If you look up the definition of potpourri, you'll find three things listed. I like this one, which says a mixture of things. And that's what the show is going to be tonight. It's going to be a mixture of B&O subjects. Not just one subject, but six, six different B&O subjects. So if you find one you don't like, you blink your eyes a couple of times, we'll probably be on to the next uh, topic. So what are we going to cover tonight? We're going to start by looking at display cabooses. So one of my friends said, you really need to lobby the people in the Bel Air to get their own caboose. So there's a lot of cabooses that are on display at various places. In fact, there's over 400 BMO cabooses that are on public display or owned by private people. Next, we're going to take a look at the fan view, train viewing area. If you don't know what that is, there's three of them now in the state of Ohio. They're, they're really uh, catching fire. We're going to take a look at something called the B&O Sunburst. And I'll, I'll tease you a little bit and tell you that uh, there's some mystery involved with the B&O Sunburst. We're going to talk about ice breaker cars, and these are not cars that break ice for your mixed drinks. Um, there's another reason for these. And yes, uh, following up with Cabooses again, I am going to give the, the short version of Caboose history, because the long version can fill up multiple books, I can see in the front here. And finally, uh, this was a new topic that I came up with, the Seven Wonders of the BNO. This kind of ties in with the Seven Wonders of the World, which you've all heard about. Uh, probably the most the common wonder of the world is the uh, Great Wall of China, which they say you can see from outer space. So with that, we'll move into the first topic here, which is display cabooses. And I've only picked cabooses that are on display around this general area. Here's one here that probably most of you know about. It's the Toy Museum at Wheeling. This caboose used to be on the uh, riverfront in downtown Wheeling. They finally decided they had had enough of it and passed it on to the Toy Museum on the east side of Wheeling. Here's a second caboose at the Barnesville, Ohio, at the local depot. This caboose uh, was originally sold by the b and to the private coal company. They had it on display in their yard at Holloway. Uh, anybody here from Holloway? Nobody here from Holloway, because I have several slides that pertain to Holloway. Holloway was always one of my favorite B&O cow names. Of course, if you go there today, there's nothing left of the huge railroad yard that was once there. 
Holloway does have their own caboose also, and they have a little park at Holloway, and this is the Holloway caboose. I was there about a month ago, and they had repainted their caboose last summer, and boy, it looks even more fantastic than what it does in this particular view. Another caboose at Holloway, this is one of the railroad uh, set off its wheels, and they were using it as a little building for one of their car inspectors. Uh, when they uh, downgraded the Holloway yard and, and closed it, they passed that caboose on to a farmer who has it just uh, east of Flushing. Difficult to get a good picture of it because of all the trees around it. And finally, this was a caboose sold to a private owner. If you look closely, you can see that uh, he has his name, Lawrence, along the side of the here. I took this picture about 30 years ago at uh, somewhere in Wheeling. I have no idea where it was. Is anybody here from Wheeling that knows where this caboose is? Nobody. Okay, well, another mystery. I'll have to go through all my millions of notes to find out about it. So if, if uh, Bel Air got their own caboose, what exactly would they, do, would they do with the caboose? Well, these are some of the reasons or some of the topics that people have used their cabooses for. Technical assistance. What, what happened? You step on the wire. What happened? Ball, ball burned out? Uh, hey, thank you, thank you. So these are some of the uh, reasons that people have used cabooses. Christmas display. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Okay, somebody in the audience has a pointer that they're pointing at there. <laughs> Well, we'll move on here. Uh, Christmas displays is certainly a popular one. Easter displays. A lot of times, uh, school wants to bring out a busload of children to take a, uh, take a look at a caboose. I would imagine most kids today probably have no idea what a caboose is or what's inside of a caboose. Some places use them as chamber of commerce offices or visitor centers and railroad museums. And the question mark here just indicates that. Uh, you wanted to with, uh, with the caboose. This is one in a suburb of Columbus, Ohio. This was owned by a private individual. He had it in his backyard, and you can see how creative he was at Christmas time. If you look closely, you can see a Santa sitting up here in the corner of the caboose uh, with the reindeers ready to take off. Uh, this picture doesn't show it all that well, but there's a whole bunch of presents that are wrapped up and on top of the caboose, and Santa's getting ready to make his delivery. Back in the good old days of actual railroad public relations, the DTI Railroad, which ran uh, from Detroit down through the state of Ohio, down through the Ohio River, every year they would take one of their cabooses and they would fix it up and they would have it on display at some of the town that they went through you could bring out your kids meet Santa, go through the caboose and i assume they would give you a sack of candy and maybe a coloring book or something to take home with you uh, but that was back in the good days of public relations railroads just don't do much of this today Next category we're going to cover is what I call train viewing areas, and this is somewhat of a, a new thing. I believe this originated, uh, at least in my opinion, in the Chicago area, but there now are three of these in Ohio that little towns have come up with, and it's just a kind of an organized place where rail fans can go to see train activity. 
This one is in Bessler, Ohio, and, and you see there's there's not much to this. It's just uh, kind of a shelter house type of environment, and you can go there and you can watch trains. Uh, they've got a scanner radio set up so you can listen to the trains that go by and listen to their uh, verbal communications. Deschler uh, used to have this sign. This is a very old picture that I took many years ago, but you'll notice that they were proud of the fact that they were the crossroads of the B&O. And that's because two major rail lines cross at Deschler. Uh, today, with all the modern train activity, Deschler, you can see a train in Deschler about every 15 minutes. And these are very long, very long trains, and I doubt today that People in Bessler are proud of the fact that they're the crossroads of the B&O because of all the activity. I was up there last Friday. Uh, I recently purchased uh, my first drone, and uh, drones are really good because you can get some overhead pictures to better show things. So you can see in this view here, this is the main line that runs from Toledo down to Columbus and beyond. This is a double track east west main line that runs from the east of the United States over to Chicago. And then you've got these connecting tracks that, uh, that allow you to go from one line to the other line. Three out of the four uh, areas have connecting tracks. And here you see the little rail fan viewing park. And people come from all over to visit these. Even though this was a regular work day on Friday, I noticed this gentleman here in his pickup truck, he had out-of-state license plates, uh, either in Illinois or Wisconsin. So we had come a long way to spend the day taking train pictures. Uh, one of the neat things that I like about Deschler, I don't go there very often because it's about a two-hour drive. This pole you see right here, it's got two cameras on it that broadcast live 24 hours a day. One camera is a fixed camera, and it is focused in this area right here. The other camera is also on that same pole. It's called a PTZ camera. And that stands for Pan, Tilt, Zoom. And there are two to three fans that have access to that camera. And they, they mostly focus, but not exclusively, on this line right here. So if a train is coming on this line, they can focus the camera on that and watch that train go around this line here. That's the camera that I normally watch because if there's something that I'm interested in and I see it, I know that it's going to take that train about three hours to get down to Dayton, Ohio. I can be at Dayton in about an hour and 15 minutes. So if there's something really fascinating or interesting on that train, I can catch it as it goes through Dayton. It doesn't happen very often, but it is really a handy tool. Oh, look here, here's another shot of Deschler. They have their own, uh, they have their own caboose, if I go back to it. And uh, this caboose used to be in the city park. They recently relocated it adjacent to the, uh, oh, I haven't had a lot of kind of troubles here. They recently located it adjacent to the main line, so it's very near the real fan viewing park. And as I told uh, a couple of guys uh, before the show tonight, I have a video caboose like this that I would be happy to sell to the fine folks of Bel Air for the lowly price of one dollar. So I think we have some interest in that, but that's what the caboose that I have looks like. Deschler just repainted their caboose last year, so that's why the caboose looks so good. They hadn't lettered it yet when I took this photograph, as you can see from the trees, this was in the fall. But virtually every one of these little towns uh, that I'm showing here has a B&O caboose. Now we move over to Fostoria, Ohio, which is about a 30 minute drive to the east of uh, Deschler, and they call their uh, rail fan viewing area the Iron Triangle. And it's really a top quality facility. Of course, they have their own B&O caboose, and had they consulted me, I would have told them that they should have built that uh, wheelchair access ramp on the back side of the caboose. Instead, they, they built it on the sunny side. They've also built a really first class, a really first class restroom facility here, and they've got an overhead uh, area here where it can protect you against rain and they've got tables that are located beneath 
Here's a, a drone view that I took last Friday that gives you a little better uh, layout look of the area here with the caboose, the restroom facility, and the overhead uh, area. They've got uh, 67 paved parking spots for fans to park at, 67. Uh, there was a railroad show here last year that I went to to see if I could sell some of my books, and afterwards I thought, I'll just drive by the rail fan park and see if anybody's there. <laughs> All 67 spots were taken by cars, and people were even parking in the grassy area to the point that there was nowhere for me to park. So all I had to do was go around their little hoop to hoop driveway and uh, go home. Why do they call it the Iron Triangle? Well, you can see here there's three different railroad lines. This is the park area right here. This black line is Norfolk Southern coming from Buffalo to Chicago. The yellow line is a CSX, former CNO, going from Toledo to Columbus. And the blue line is CSX, former BO, going from the east to the next stop, the next town, which is basically Desher, we just looked at, and continuing on to Chicago. So, constant train activity all the time through here. If you don't know where Fossoria is, you can locate it on this Ohio map right here. And as I say, Nashville is about a 30 minute drive to the west. This is the latest fan viewing area. This was built in the uh, northern suburb of Columbus called Worthington. And you can see that they spent quite a bit of money on, on this. This is the same caboose that I showed earlier that the reindeer were on. This is the area here on the north side of Columbus, relatively new one that just opened a couple of years ago. And this is the same caboose that I showed you earlier that had the reindeer at Christmas time. And you can see that uh, the city of Worthington, money is no object, really. This, this whole area here, they have a huge parking lot. They have a couple of ball fields back to the left. They have a huge uh, park and recreation department building with an indoor swimming pool and uh, various classrooms. You can take the yoga and all that kind of stuff. The actual rail fan viewing area here shows a double track CSX, uh, I should say, Norfolk Southern main line going through here. And then about 15 yards to the east, there's a single track CSX line. Uh, the times that I've uh, staked out this area, you can see a train about once an hour, so not nearly as many trains as you can see in the northern part of the state. Uh, the, the architect did one of the things here which is kind of neat, and that is they sunk the caboose down into the ground. And the reason for that is if you're wheelchair access, you can come right off the parking lot, down the sidewalk, and this sidewalk back here matches right up with the end platform of the caboose. So, by sinking the caboose down into the ground, uh, he was able to make it wheelchair accessible without building one of those big ugly uh, ramps. Uh, he wasn't really in tune with uh, railroad history, though. He, he told me that he really wanted to build a platform on top of the caboose so fans could climb up there and take pictures. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, that didn't happen. Uh, he also said he wanted to get a two-way radio so the fans could talk to the trains as they pass there, which is uh, a definite no-no with the federal government. All right, next we're going to move into a category here called the diesel sunburst, and uh, this is a little bit longer category. I mentioned earlier that there's some mystery involving the diesel sunburst. What is the diesel sunburst? Well, it's, it's this emblem right here. And the reason they called it the sunburst is pretty obvious. Uh, the DNO emblem, it looks like the sun, 
And those rays sticking out of it looks like a uh, sun ray. And so it got the name of the sunburst. Now we take a look here on this graph of B and O profitability throughout the 1950s. And I just didn't make these numbers up. I, I pulled these from uh, B and O annual reports to the point that you can see in 1962, B and O made no profit whatsoever. So when you, when you don't make any profit, there's uh, one important thing that you take a look at, and that is you, you take a look at uh, your assets and see what can we do to reduce costs. Uh, this was the typical B&O locomotive paint scheme for passenger diesels and this type of freight diesel uh, at that period. And if you look at all the colors on here, you've got uh, gray at the top, you've got blue, you've got black, you've got uh, imitation gold, you've got all the labor to do the striping, you've got the road numbers spelled out. Very, very costly to apply this. And then the other thing is, a lot of those paint colors would have to allow them to dry in your paint shop so that you could mask it off and, and do the other color. So you've got one of your most important assets sitting in the paint shop waiting for paint to dry. So what do you do in this case? Well, you, uh, you try to uh, come up with a cheaper paint scheme. A lot of people call this a dip paint scheme because it looks like you take the locomotive and you dip it into a, a can of blue paint. I believe, and I emphasize the word believe, that this was an experimental uh, paint scheme with the sunburst emblem. Uh, this is the only unit that we've ever found that has this unusual kind of graphics that are on the front of it here. Uh, so because of that, I think this was an early test unit that never, that never panned out. So B&O needed new locomotives in 1962, but as you just saw, they didn't have any money to spend on new locomotives. General Motors, if you look closely, you can see the little GM sticker right on the front here. General Motors had a big locomotive manufacturing facility in the Chicago area. It was known as their Electromotive Division, which is the EMD on the other side. And they came out with a brand new locomotive in 1962 called the G. 30, GP for general purpose. And you can see in this picture here, they had invited many of the uh, Robert executive executives to come out and take a look at this brand new locomotive. Well, B&O would have loved to get some of these brand new GP 30s, but uh, as I say, they didn't have any uh, money to buy them. There were two railroads that were attempting to take over B&O. One was the CNO, Chesapeake and Ohio. And the other was the New York Central. And the CNO went out and uh, they merged with the BNO on February 4th, 1963. They called it a merger, really, it was more of a takeover because CNO had all of the money, the BNO didn't have any. And so they came up with this very creative emblem called the CNO BNO emblem. It appeared on all of their paperwork thereafter, brochures, uh, things like that appeared on a few of their maintenance away trucks, but never on locomotive equipment. Locomotives, passenger cars, freight cars, they were never labeled the CNO, BNO. They, they kept their own identities of either CNO or BNO. And so the CNO gave the BNO enough money to buy seven, seven of these brand new GP30s. And one of the neat things that uh, E&D did was when they sold one of these new locomotives to a new customer, they hired this, uh, this artist to uh, paint the new GP30 or whatever the locomotive was operating in the context of the particular railroad. In this case here, this is the B&O location where the B&O comes out of the tunnel. You see the tunnel in the background here. That's the state of Maryland. They cross over the Potomac River and they enter the state of West Virginia at a location called Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. So I always loved these paintings because the painter that would do these, he would angle these locomotives in such a manner as to show power. And that, that was the big drawing card for the drawings that he made out. So this is one of the new BNO GP30s. And you'll notice the sunburst emblem that's on the front of the locomotive. Not only on the front, but also on the back of it also. 
when the B&O did something special or had something brand new, they would always take it to a location here in Fog Hall, south of Baltimore, uh, on this uh, viaduct. It was a double track viaduct, and this was the main line, which is still in use today with CSX, the main line that runs between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. This is known as Thomas Viaduct. And you see they've got two brand new GP30s and a bunch of uh, brand new B&O trailers also. They featured this uh, picture on their 1964 calendar, and what they did was they cropped off the top of it and cropped off the bottom of it just to show the trend. So it looked good because it was in color. What I'm trying to find is this overall view here in color, which I still haven't found. And this is a close-up view of what one of the BNO GP30s look like, and clearly you can see the sunburst on the front of it. Not only the sunburst, but if you look closely, the BNO emblem right here is a cast emblem. It's, uh, those cast emblems were very, very heavy, and they become highly collectible. In fact, there's some people that say they started disappearing from the locomotives. Using cast emblems like this dates back to the early 1940s on the steam engines. So there's many different styles and sizes of these cast emblems. I, I've written a whole, uh, whole article on the history of them. Eventually, though, the GP30s were the last locomotives to get the cast emblem. They were kind of expensive, and so they went to the sticker emblem. And you can see the trailing unit here has the sticker emblem on it. Older locomotives also got the solid blue scheme and a representation of the sunburst emblem. It didn't look as good as it did on the GP30s, but they did paint the older locomotives like this. Now we get into the mystery. The sunburst emblem disappeared almost as quickly as it came out. And there's three different stories as to why the sunburst emblem disappeared. The first story says that a lot of the BNO employees had served in World War II and they thought the sunburst emblem reminded them of the Japanese flag. Here's a look at the Japanese flag. What I did was I took this into Photoshop and I eliminated some of the rays that were on the flag. And then I compared it with the sunburst emblem and you can see that there certainly is a definite comparison there. And so that's story number one, that employees were given the uh, PO management a hard time about the Sunburst Sunburst. The second story says that the president of the BNO, who was a German slagman for a short period of time in the early 1960s, when he saw the Sunburst Sunburst for the first time, he told his locomotive people to get something that had some class. Now, uh, some of the older locomotives, they just didn't look good with the sunburst emblem. And if this was one of the locomotives that Mr. Langdon saw, I would agree that it doesn't look very good. It did look good on the other GP30s. So that's the second story. Again, we don't have any way to verify whether these stories are accurate or not. CNO, who I mentioned earlier, took over BNO, gave BNO the money to buy the GP30s. They also bought the GP30s, not as many as BNO did. I think CNO bought 48 of them versus the 77 that BNO bought. But this is the way they had their locomotives painted, a much more conservative paint scheme. And the third story was that the CNO officials in Cleveland. Uh, we're giving Mr. Langdon a hard time because they thought the BNO GP30 scheme outclassed the CNO units. I said that the CNO or the BNO sunburst came quickly and disappeared quickly. If you look at this graph here, the GP30s were built in this period here, and that's when they were painting old locomotives, also in that scheme. And you can see just how quickly. Uh, the scheme disappeared. This was based on photo analysis uh, that I had done. But as these units went through the large locomotive shops that come to the Maryland, they painted over the sunburst emblem. 
So this is a look at the scheme that they came up with here. You see four GPU fairies, but they painted over just the ends of the engines and the back side. They didn't paint the whole engine, and then they applied a larger size BNO sticker in them. Now, if the BNO, I look at it like this: if the BNO was really in financial straits, somebody had to approve buying the paint, spending the labor to paint over the sunburst. Spending the labor to buy the new 3M emblems, which are not cheap, and to and just for the sake of improving the looks of the locomotives, they don't run any better like this. But I'm thinking for that decision to be made, they had to come from a very high source, probably President Landon. So he may have been getting hit from all sides. He may have been getting hit from his employees, from the CNO of Cleveland, and based on his own personal observations. Notice along the bottom here, the last GP30 with the sunburst was built in January 63. Just about one year later in 64, the BNO bought some more locomotives. These were GP35s, which was the next evolution. And this is the way they came out with no sunburst. Uh, and this was the first time that the CNO and the BNO consolidated their paint schemes. CNO units were pretty much painted the same way, with the exception that they retained their yellow noses. Fortunately, the BNO Museum in Baltimore was able to save one of the BNO GP30s, the 6944, and they repainted it back into the original paint scheme, and you can see it today. Uh, at the BNO Museum. I like the Sunburst so well, it's always been my, my favorite. I thought the GP30 was the best looking BNO locomotive and the Sunburst really looked good on them. But I approached the railroad uh, a few years ago and I asked them if I could paint one of their cabooses to uh, look like a Sunburst caboose. And they, they uh, came through with it. And the caboose that I asked for was the 904063 because 63 was the year that the Sunburst locomotives came out. So this was the 25th anniversary of the Sunburst on the BNO, and most of you know 25th anniversary means silver anniversary, which is the reason that I painted the truck silver. So I didn't do all the work myself. I had some of my friends come in and help me. Uh, Jim Lundgren, the assistant superintendent at Woodward, liked this so well that he ordered the Brought to Willard and they used them on their Willard to act in a local terminal and then subsequently wrecked This is one of my cabooses that I own, in which I keep at Nelsonville, Ohio, and I, it was originally an LN caboose, Louisville National, and I repainted it to be a BNO Sunburst caboose. I wanted one of this style of caboose because when we take people on caboose rides, I can set out a bunch of lawn chairs on these end platforms and people can enjoy uh, riding in the open air. We do a caboose train once a year during the month of October. Next category I want to cover is uh, icebreaker cars, a topic that I kind of, kind of find it interesting. And we'll start by looking at how they ship automobiles originally. They, they tried to ship them in Box cars, believe it or not. And in this photograph here, I count six, maybe seven people that are attempting to load these automobiles in the box cars. A very labor intensive process. And even if you were able to get them loaded in there, you could only get four automobiles in one box car. So it was a very costly thing that they were trying to do back then. So the railroad of course, uh, wasn't making as much money as they would have liked. So they came up with the idea of building these 86 foot long flat cars with three decks on them. Much easier to load, very, very efficient, and uh, definitely the way to go. The problem with this was in the wintertime, BNO has a lot of tunnels, as do other railroads. Uh oh. And in the wintertime, these tunnels leak water and they cause icicles or stalagmites to form. And some of these stalagmites are very, very large. So you can imagine what happens when one of those triple-decker automobile cars goes through the tunnel 
and beat them over the state. A lot of claims on damage to brand new automobiles with broken windshields, scratched hoods, dents, etc. And so the solution they came up with was to take a number of the old coal cars and build these big heavy duty structures on each end of them. And the purpose of this was so when these cars went through a tunnel, they would probably sort of knock off the icicles that would fall into the car and then eventually melt. So they would uh, put one of these cars in any the train that had the automobile cars in it. Of course, they would put it ahead of the automobile cars so that would protect them. Originally, they were painted yellow so they would stand out and not be confused with regular coal cars. And in the summertime, they were not used. So in the summertime, I photographed this big long string of them lined up in the yard of Cumberland, Maryland. I'm not sure why that covered hopper is in there. It really has nothing to do with vice regular cars. And of course, uh, as probably most of you can guess by now, the ultimate solution was to have a totally enclosed car which protected the cars from not only icicles but also from uh, theft and vandalism. It's a little bit difficult to tell in this picture here, but these cars had indoors also that closed up, so the cars were fully sealed. And of course, they were easy to load or not load. They had a ramp structure here, uh, hydraulics. Uh, they could adjust it to whichever level they wanted to to load or unload the cars. Fortunately, one of the icebreaker cars has been saved to be in the museum in Baltimore. It's uh, awaiting restoration, so obviously it's not open to the public right now. But they do have one hopefully someday. It'll uh, be able to go through their shop and, and get sandblasted and get a nice coat of yellow paint. Okay, now we get into the uh, topic here that everybody is anxiously waiting for. And this is my uh, this is my Cliff Notes version of Caboose history. This is what some of the earliest cabooses looked like. They were very small. They only had four wheels under them. They garnered the name of the bobber cabooses because the story was they kind of bobbed along at the end of the train. It's interesting that a lot of the conductors uh, took a lot of pride in their cars. There's stories about some of the conductors who made you take your shoes off before you could come inside of their caboose. And if you look at this caboose here, you can see the fancy uh, draperies that are hanging in the windows. This was this photograph here probably taken around 1900, 1905. Fortunately, the B&O Museum in Baltimore has saved one of the bottom cabooses. This was reportedly the last one in service, and it was up in New York State when they were able to bring it to the B&O Museum. I asked earlier if anybody here was here from Holloway. Nobody, nobody volunteered that. This is a view of the Holloway yard back in its glory days. And you can see the long string of Dr. Cabooses lying up here. I suspect this picture was taken about 1910. And what's interesting with this picture is uh, you can find these postcards. They, they show up occasionally on eBay. Uh, but back long before eBay, somebody had one and it was uh, blown up and it's displayed now on the wall of the Holloway Post Office. And I, I stopped in the Holloway about a month ago just to confirm that it was still there and, and sure enough it was. Uh, the building was uh, built in 1966 as you can see during the Lyndon Johnson administration. Uh, this is kind of, a, kind of a neat picture and there's an interesting story behind how this got made, and I actually got involved at, at the rear end of it. So, uh, but that's a story for another time. In 1913, the BNO legislature passed a law that became known as the Ohio Caboose Law, where they said, We don't want any more bottle cabooses operating in the state of Ohio. And they passed certain requirements that cabooses had to have. The caboose had to be 24 feet long. It had to have 24-inch end platforms. It had to have four wheel trucks under each end. And there were a number of, uh, of other refinements that had to be incorporated also, including some of the interior equipment. 
So the railroads had to uh, redesign a larger caboose that met those uh, state of Ohio requirements. So this is the type of caboose that um, B and O came up with. Of course, this pertained all railroads, not just the B and O. And so the state of Ohio said, uh, we're going to give you four years to meet this requirement. You have to convert 25% of your caboose fleet each year, such that at the end of the four years, all your cars uh, will be converted to this style of caboose. Now, there were some exceptions. If the bomber caboose was used in yard service, I think they, they accepted that. In 1930, VO came up with a revolutionary uh, caboose design. And I can't emphasize enough just how revolutionary this was. There had never been a bay window caboose with a full side bay uh, that any railroad had come up with. VO was the very first. And this was the car C2500. It was one of these side bays, which was on each side of the caboose. And the philosophy was, as freight cars were getting taller and taller, they reasoned that a person sitting in the cupola of the cupola caboose couldn't really see anything except the high freight car ahead of them. So uh, the main window caboose had some advantages, and that being that you could look along the side of the train for any defects. So the C2500 was always my favorite caboose because of the very uh, historic nature of this car, and, and obviously it would be a future BMW Museum candidate. This is a picture of that same caboose after it had been repainted blue with yellow ends, taken uh, probably in 1974, 1975, not by me, but by one of my friends. Always my favorite caboose, and um, I was always looking. See, the stop sign was here to cause, me, to cause me not to advance ahead to the next picture, which I just did. So uh, even putting the stop sign in here, I, I still messed up. But everywhere I, I went, and I was traveling across the BMO a lot back then, I was looking for caboose C2500. I had no idea where that caboose was. Every time I went to a VO yard, I would go in, I would talk to the yard master, and I would say, Do you have caboose C2500 in this area? And they usually would have a piece of paper there or a little note card with the cabooses that they had in that area. And of course, they would always say, No, we don't have it. So I was traveling across southern Indiana and southern Illinois following the VO, and I went into the yard office in Washington, Indiana, and talked to the yard master, and uh, he said, No, I, I don't have that caboose here. And I said, Well, do you know where it's at? No, I don't know where it's at. So the art office there was a rather large room, and there were uh, multiple clerks working in there at, at their desks. And I turned around to leave, and, and one of the clerks in the back of the room said, hey, buddy, come over here. Somebody wants to talk to you. And he held up a black telephone receiver. And, uh, of course, I was rather scared. I figured, well, this is the b &O police department or the superintendent, and they're really going to nailed me for trespassing in here and talking to the yard master. So I go back and I pick up the telephone receiver and I very sheepishly say, uh, hello. And the uh, voice on the other end of the phone, a very authoritative voice, he says, uh, I understand you're looking for Caboose C2500, is that correct? And I say, yes. And the voice says, uh, what is your interest in this Caboose? And I explained the interest to him. And the voice says, uh, well, I've got bad news for you. That caboose was just destroyed in the derailment last week at Warren, Ohio. And I just felt my, my heart go down in my stomach. I couldn't believe it. The most famous caboose on the b the caboose that I was sure would end up at the b Museum someday, had been destroyed. So I kind of regained my, my confidence, and I said, uh, how is it that you know this? And the voice said, this is the caboose desk in Baltimore. We know where every caboose is. So I'm thinking to myself, wow, I'm a caboose fan, and there's a caboose desk in Baltimore that knows where every caboose is. I, I need to get to know these people. So, uh, you know, at this point in my career, I wasn't thinking about the fact that I'd be doing presentations someday. I, I got the idea later that I should be thinking about. 
But uh, it really would be nice if I had a picture of me talking on the phone. This would be a great place to put that slide in to this presentation. So I got to thinking, you know, I, I think I'm a pretty good artist. I can do uh, one of those artist uh, sketches, you know, like they do in courtrooms. The judge says no cameras allowed in the courtroom. And uh, they, what, what do they do? They hire a uh, sketch artist to come in and he's sitting there and he's drawing a sketch of the lawyers or the, uh, the person sitting at the witness chair. And so I thought, well, I, I can do the same thing. I, I can make a nice sketch like that and be talking on the telephone. And so th this would have been a lot funnier if I hadn't advanced it earlier, even though I put the stop sign. So some of my friends said, boy, that, that looks just like you, or you don't have any hair, you're kind of skinny. And so I, I had to put the rendition on here that that's just an artist's rendition. That's not really me talking on the telephone in Washington, Indiana. Uh, I did make friends with everybody at the caboose desk. They, uh, they got to the point that every year when I went to Baltimore to do research, I would stop in and see them. I talked to them a lot on the telephone, and they were really instrumental in helping me get uh, pictures of all the video you know, producers that I needed because they knew exactly where they were. And uh, I've gotten a little bit smarter here by this year and now. This is in 1975, and this uh, gentleman right here at the first desk, he's working the caboose desk. And he has a listing of every caboose the BO has, and what he does all day long is he pulls all over the BO system, talks to train masters and yard masters, and then he records what cabooses they have. If there's a train leaving, he records that and where that train's going to, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, there were five people that worked the caboose desk. He would work uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, on this particular day, this was actually a filming. Five. I got to know all, all five of the people, and they were all very cooperative to me. And of course, I kept them supplied with pictures and all that, which they never got to see. It's interesting that uh, the rest of the people in this uh, modern room here, that was known as the Power Wheel. Uh, they were doing the same thing that the Boost Nest was doing, but they were doing it with locomotives. Uh, they wanted to make sure that the BNO had properly staged locomotives in the uh, terminals that they needed to have them staged at, so that when the train was ready, uh, they had the locomotives available. So this whole department was known as the Power Bureau, and uh, not too long after this photograph was taken, it was all moved to Jacksonville. So one of my friends uh, later sent me this picture of Caboose C2500. What had happened was these freight cars here on the left had broken loose and had rolled down the track and had uh, crashed into it. My favorite Caboose C2500 basically destroyed it. So I was bound and determined to say that I photographed Caboose C2500. So I tracked down a wreckage which by this time had been moved to Newcastle, Pennsylvania, and a very cooperative car for me said, yes, we have those two bottles here. He said, you just walk down this big long track here, way down here, and you'll find the bottles down here. So I did that on this day in July. I remember it clearly, it was like 150 degrees. And uh, not only that, but the heat was emanating up from this uh, black, uh, Senders that were on the rail here. And so I found the two gondolas with the remains in there, a C2500. I climbed up on them and I had to balance myself on this little short wedge right here. And I got the got this shot here. This was obviously the underframe with the wheels. It looked like the body had been decapitated from the underframe. And then I turned my camera in the opposite direction, and this was the scrunched up mess. It looked like somebody had taken a piece of aluminum foil and scrunched it up and, uh, and was able to get the body in this kind of little bit. Now I'm sure there's some people that would say, how do we know that's really Caboose C2500? You could have just photographed any old wreck car and claimed that was C2500. Well, that's very true, except for uh, this picture here, which I found a section of the end of the caboose. And you can see this was the doorway here into the caboose, and obviously the end window, and I was really glad to 
glad to get a nice piece of uh, memorabilia here with the loose lumber stamp on it. So the DNO continued to build by window caboose. This is a 1940s version now at the DNO Museum. This is a, uh, come on, cooperate with me here. This is a 1965 66 version. Uh, this was the first time DNO actually purchased cabooses from a custom caboose builder. National Park at Kenton, Ohio. Uh, before that, they built their own cabooses in their own shops. And this is an even more modern version. This is from 1971 from International Car. And this is the type of caboose that I have available for the fine folks at Delaware for the lower price of $1. Of course, my car doesn't look quite that good. It's never been repainted. So it needs a sandblasting job. And Nice paint job, but it does have a full interior. And so now we move to the last segment of my program tonight, which I call Seven Wonders of the DNO. And I emailed some of my friends and, and I said, What what did you consider the seven wonders of the DNO? And of course, as you might guess, we had hardly any agreement at all. So these are just my items here that I wanted to nominate. And the first would be the B&O Museum in Baltimore. It started with this covered roundhouse in 1953, and gradually it has uh, expanded since that time. They've expanded out here in what they call the front yard. They've expanded into the back here with the backyard. They expanded into this building here, which is, is known as the uh, North Car Shop. And then they took over this building here, which was known as the South Car Shop. The North Car Shop has um, a full of historic displays. The South Car Shop is basically just kind of like a storage facility. You know, we all we all have our stuff that we like to keep stored, right? Recently, though, the BL Museum has undertaken a thirty million dollar campaign to refurbish the South Car Shop, and it was kicked off with a five million dollar donation from CSX. So uh, they hope to have that part of the museum open by 2028, that's four years from now. And the reason that date is important is that's the 200th anniversary of the DNO. The last big celebration that they had planned was for the 175th birthday of the DNO. Some of you may, uh, may think about that. I came up with the idea of taking one of the DNO caboose's that was still in service on CSX and painting it up into an anniversary paint scheme. And I had to supply a drawing to the railroad and it took them 12 months to give me the approval, but they finally came through and this was the caboose that, that I painted with help from my brother. And uh, it subsequent, subsequently traveled all over the DNO from Florida to Michigan on a welded rail train. And so uh, we got a lot of PR from that. They just recently took this caboose out, out of service uh, last year. But the 175th anniversary of the DNO never happened. The birthday party that was, the big birthday party that was planned never happened. This was the only celebration that marked the anniversary of the DNO. Why is that? Well, there was a 28 inch snow in Baltimore that collapsed the roof of the DNO Museum, damaging all of the historic equipment that you can see inside of here. And they took some of the insurance money from this and they did a really wise thing and they built a top quality state of the art restoration shop about a half mile uh, west of here. And over the years since then, they have been able to uh, restore almost every piece of equipment that was damaged in this uh, catastrophe. And of course, they also uh, replaced the roof. Now, what was interesting was with all the modern uh, computer technology today, they were able to determine that, when, that there was a design flaw when uh, this roof was constructed back in the 1860s. So everything fixed up nice and uh, neat today. Uh, number two on my list would be Thomas Wyandotte. We talked about this earlier when we saw two brand new GP30s. And I mentioned that BNO used this as a PR tool to stage so many different 
trains and, and other things on this viaduct. Still in service today, still public track, still all CSX freight trains, Amtrak passenger trains, and uh, State of Maryland Department of Transportation commuter trains. Third on my list is this depot, Point of Rocks, Maryland. Beautiful depot, it's still there today. This is where the line splits. You can see a railroad line on the, on the back side over here. And that's the line that goes to Washington, D.C. On the front side here, this is the, what they call the old main line that goes to Baltimore. Next on my list is two more covered roundhouses. This is Martinsburg, West Virginia. These, these date to 1866. BNO finally uh, moved their engineering facilities uh, out of this area and uh, it's taken over locally and uh, refurbished. <coughs> And this is what it looks like today. The roundhouse on the right uh, did catch fire and burn down. But you can see the rest of the buildings uh, still are there. They've been restored. The area has been cleaned up. They built this uh, safety walkway up and over the CSX main line. They tore down a bunch of buildings in this area here to improve parking. So uh, it's available for um, total general purpose activity. Next on my agenda is another viaduct. This viaduct is known as Trey Run Viaduct. And even though it only has three arches, it's very, very high. You can see just how high it is in the context of the CSX freight train. Uh, obviously, CSX still uses this today at the Hall Coal from uh, West Virginia to the East Coast. One of the uh, movers and shakers who grew up in uh, the little town of Rollsburg, which is down to the left at the bottom of the hill, he came up with the idea several years ago that he wanted to celebrate the 150th anniversary of Trade Run Viaduct. And so we got permission from CSX that they could bring a bus. And you see the bus back here. Well, uh, once again, we're having some troubles. You can see this little white bus back here in the background. You can buy a ticket down here at Rollsburg, drive up the right away in this bus, and then have the ability to walk across Terry Run by and I can be posed here with your cameras. And keep your fingers crossed that you can photograph a train coming across there, which was just luck in this case. Uh, this individual over here was the CSX safety manager from Huntington, West Virginia, who, who was on site to uh, make sure everything came off without a hitch, uh, which it did. And of course, you will never be able to do something like this today. The CSX just won't allow people to come on the property for any kind of reason whatsoever. But that was a neat event. And the other thing, the other idea the guy had was something that you can all relate to here at Hunter Valley area is he wanted to light up the arches at nighttime. And so he called the National Guard to bring down their uh, lighting and uh, they hooked it up. Oh, the heartbreak. They hooked it up and uh, were able to light up the arches. This was only for one evening only, but they were able to light up the arches and uh, people could take pictures of it. Uh, he had grandiose plans of cutting all these trees down, but that never happened. This picture was taken from the state highway that runs along the bottom of the hill. And finally on my list, how can I leave out the Breakstone Viaduct, right? It's going to be one of the seven waters of the Viaduct. And uh, I saw, I was not here for the very first weekend that it was lit up, but I saw a picture on the internet. That was a very intriguing picture. Because it showed the viaduct lit up with a blue sky in the background. And I said, man, that's, that's fantastic. I'm going to have to make it over there and, and get some of those. Because I was working on an article for the BNO Story Society on the uh, Great Southern Viaduct. So I did. I came over the second weekend. I made some phone calls. I found out what, uh, how, how it worked. The lights come on at the dusk and they go off at 11 o'clock Friday, Saturday, Sunday. 
So the second weekend, uh, I, I come over from Columbus, and uh, what's this? Oh, I, I remember now, the lights never sort of came on. So uh, I made some phone calls, and I was uh, placed in contact with a guy by the name of Ed Molly. Is you know Ed Molly? Is, is that here today? <laughs> And uh, Ed said, uh, grab a cup of coffee, I'll be there in 20 minutes. And he was nice enough to come down, and he says, uh, you know, I can't help you with the light blue sky, but um, uh, I can at least turn the lights on manually. So uh, Ed came down and opened up the lighting control box, and uh, thank you, Ed, for doing that. And uh, he, he turned on the lights manually, and I was able to get uh, nice, some nice light shots here from various angles. Unfortunately, it wasn't the light blue sky that I wanted, it was the black sky. So, um, Ed assured me that everything had, had been investigated and the problem had been corrected. So, I decided on the third weekend I was going to come back over again to get that light blue sky shot that I really wanted. And so, the third weekend I, I came back again. Oh, wait. So, oh, I, I, I remember now the lights didn't come on again on the third weekend. So Ed, uh, I called my, by this time, close personal friend, Ed Mauer, and he said, uh, I'll be hopping down and see what's going on. And so uh, he couldn't tell, and this time he brings the sun with me. Well, I, I understand both of them are electrical engineers, right? So uh, thank you, Ed, for coming down uh, twice now. And they were able to turn on the lights manually. And uh, I'm going to get to get the same shots and get the black sky. <laughs> so I, I, wasn't, I wasn't giving up on this. So we're now down to the fourth weekend. And I come back again and, and Ed assures me, he says, everything now has been fixed. He said, whenever you get there, what you want to do is you want to go during the daylight hours and check out this lighting control box that you all see here because we made some positive improvements there too. So I said, okay, so I get there at daylight hours and I go to the uh, lighting control box and I see that Ed has, uh, Ed has taken some, taken some steps to fix this. I guess it's going to help pay the electric bill also. And then it's just a good idea. It's kind of like a car wash. You know, you go in, you have your quarters and you put them in the slots and you get you get, uh, you get your car hose. So, uh, I, have, I have another idea for that. Uh, could you install a credit card reader? <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I don't carry a pocket full of quarters with me, but I do use credit cards a lot, especially gasoline pumps. So I think you put one of those credit card readers on there. That would be a definite help. Um, the last job that I had, one of my activities was I was in charge of continuous improvement. Continuous improvement is making things better today than they were yesterday, making things better tomorrow than what they are today. So this uh, this hit, hit home with me here because everything about the Great Southern Viaduct is just top quality. I mean, the trail on top, the parking area, the railings, uh, the way they did the lighting, uh, the, the uh, promenade there on the bottom, all that, just top quality. And all the people that I met associated with the Great Southern Viaduct, just top quality people. Uh, so I don't understand this unpainted piece of plywood here. Uh, and could, couldn't we take up a collection of like quarts of gray paint and, and paint this piece of plywood? My, my boss, my old boss, he would never stand for that. He would be telling me to get some kind of paintbrush and some gray paint and paint that plywood. Plus, it's going to deteriorate without any paint on it. So that, that's my one positive suggestion. Uh, and by the way, I'll, I'll have to do truth in advertising. Those aren't really on the lighting control box. I I, I just did that for that. I thought it would be a good for a company. But the good news was, the fourth weekend, I was able to get the light in the sky that I really wanted. So. And uh, I've been told that the Vienna Historical Society has accepted my article to be out in the April issue. Uh, and I submitted 11 photographs to go with that article. I don't know how many they'll actually use. 
But uh, you can go onto their website and they will show you for free the first six pages of their uh, magazine. They won't show you all 40 pages, but obviously you might be a join and you can pay a membership fee. But you can purchase individual copies for $8. So if you're interested in the uh, Society's magazine, uh, you might follow up uh, on that. Now I know Dan Frizzy belongs to them and he gets the magazine. So I think if all of you gather together as a group and go down to Dan's office, I'm, I'm sure he would allow you to look at his copy of the magazine. Oh, look, here's a caboose that's on display by the great son of I have. Uh, that, that's, that's exactly the kind of caboose that I have available for only one dollar. How about that? It would look so good down here. Okay, I said there were going to be seven wonders of the world, and I knew there was going to be a disagreement between me and all of you young fans, so I'm leaving the seventh one open here, uh, just with the idea that you can plug in your own idea of what number seven is. So with that, I uh, would conclude uh, my show today. I do want to put in a little plug. I do have my papers set up here with all of my books. Uh, you know, I, I, I should tell you, this, this is not a profit-making thing for me. It's not even a break-even thing for me. Whatever book that I do, I have to personally subsidize it. But it's a hobby. You know, some people like to go to Las Vegas with their money, or Disney World, or Myrtle Beach, play golf on the weekends. All that stuff costs money. So with, with my extra money, you know, I like to do books. So the books are available if anybody wants to buy one. They range from $15 to $60. Uh, but I'm a terrible salesman. I, I love doing books, but I hate being a salesman. So I would, I would say this, that uh, if my comments is not working out for you the way the president says it is, I donated a copy of each of my books to the library here at the Delaware. So you can go to the library and check out one of my books for free. And then if you see something that you like and you want to buy one for Uncle John at Christmas time, all my contact information is in the back of the books. I also have a bunch of business cards along the front of my table here, so feel free to pick up a business card if, if you're so interested. And, uh, come on, come on, Mr. President. Yeah, that's it. So, thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Well, uh, people ask me if I take questions, I might say yes. I take questions, it's the answers I have trouble with. <laughs> so, how? <coughs> question. Yeah. Okay, Dan. Dan Frizzy. I've, I've also seen the icebreakers that have the, uh, the rods on them around. Does the BO use those as well? No, those are not the. the, the one of the things that I have noticed from the past three weeks that I uh, watch these YouTube things live is you can never hear the question. You can you can hear the presenter give his answer, but you can never hear what the question is. So I so I decided I'm going to repeat the question. So the question that has been asked is the E and O had a special car with a bunch of arms sticking out of it, and, and was that car used as an ice breaker car? And the answer is no, it wasn't. That was a special car. We only had one. And they used it to measure the inside of tons. As they would go through a tunnel, they would extend those arms out, and every arm had dimensions on it. And by that way, they could know what the profile of that tunnel was. And by the way, that, uh, that tunnel, they called it the tunnel gauge car. That car has been saved today to the B&O Museum, and it's on display inside the roundhouse. That's where I saw it. That's why I make the big bucks. <laughs> Question here. Well, 
Well, and one other thing that I wanted to say, now, several years ago, in 1970, there was a movie that was filmed across on the West Virginia side at Moundsville on the Foots Parade. I have an interest in what the B&O involvement was in that movie. I've searched uh, a lot to try to find stuff. And, and the local libraries, they've got uh, newspaper clippings and things like that. But I want to find pictures of the B&O equipment. They had a caboose. They had a couple of box cars. They brought a steam engine in that was relettered for B&O. They had passenger cars. So if you know anybody that was taking pictures back in that era, or maybe there are people in the audience here that had pictures back in that area, here, uh, my, make sure you pick up one of my business cards here so you can uh, get in touch with me. I do keep a close watch on, on eBay, uh, so I found a few things on, on eBay, but not enough to do an article. I'd like to do an article on the B&O's involvement in that 1970s movie that started the Jimmy story. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Ohio, the name Baltimore, Ohio, does not refer to the state. As in 1828, when the BIO was formed, their goal was to build passage to the Ohio River, the first of the river, not the state. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Another question. How many of those cat DNO emblems did you steal? I mean, do you have? <laughs> I'm probably embarrassed to say, and, and the question was how many uh, DNO cats capital donor emblems do I have? I did write an article, a very extensive article on those. There's, um, uh, well, I think there's 12 different styles of those, different diameter sizes, and some have open ampersands and some have closed ampersands. And I've probably got a couple of dozen. Any other questions? What exactly did they use the caboose for? I mean, what was the purpose? I always thought maybe the guys just stayed in here. I, I knew that question would come up, so I had a slide for that. So I put in my plug for, for full spray. So the purpose of a caboose, uh, today and back when we had a caboose, it was an observation point. There were two guys that rode in the caboose, and uh, it was not only an observation point, but uh, the conductor was in the caboose and he had all of the paperwork that was on the train. Today, we don't have those people because we have blindside detectors that watch for defects that are on the caboose. Uh, secondly, the purpose of the caboose is as a home away from home for the conductor and the rear flagman. When a train left point A and went to point B, they had to wait for a train to come back to their home terminal. So while they were away from the home terminal, they might have to spend the night in the caboose. Today, the union agreement calls for crews to be housed in hotels. Uh, the caboose had tools in it, parts for repair. Uh, today, basically, it's not needed. The modern uh, cars just don't break down the way the old wooden cars do. Uh, the caboose identified the rear of the train. Uh, today, it's replaced by what's known as a thread. Uh, FRED is an acronym that stands for Flashing Rear End Device. It's a device that hooks up to the air hose and it sends a radio signal to the engineer and the big locomotive of what the air pressure is on, on back. When uh, the FREDs first came out, it was kind of interesting. The rubber people had a different name for the F. You can probably guess what that derogatory name was. 
On white and purple, I just want to get rid of caboose as well. There were several reasons. The high cost. The last caboose that VL uh, purchased in 1980, they cost $80,000 a piece. If we apply inflation to that, if they bought new cabooses today, they would cost $284,000 a piece, and that was in uh, 2022. It was a safety hazard. You had people working in the caboose, and uh, they were getting in there because of something called slack action. Uh, they were very costly to maintain. They had to be repaired. They had to be painted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they were costly to switch in railroad yards when they, uh, back in the old days, when a train left point A and went to point B, they had to take that conductor's train off, that conductor's caboose off the train and put the next conductor's caboose on the train. Every conductor had their own caboose. And then finally, the, uh, the railroads uh, went to what they call pool cabooses, which means caboose can travel about anywhere and it's not assigned to any uh, conductor. Something that I haven't heard most people talk about is um, back in the good old days, back when I first became interested in the railroads in the 1960s, uh, a train crew consisted of five people, and these are the five people here. The three people on the left rode in the locomotive, the two people on the right rode in the caboose. Today, there's only two person crews. There's an engineer and a conductor, and they both ride in the engine. So even if we still had cabooses today, there's more or less the right in caboose. And prior to this big mess up, up, in, up at the East Palestine, which you've all heard, heard about, many of the top executive officers in the railroads, they were talking about they wanted to go to a one-person crew, just an engineer only. And that talk has pretty much died off after, after East Palestine. But it's bound to come back. It'll be a couple of years, maybe, and East Palestine will fade away, and they'll start talking again about the fact that they only want one person running a train. And I suspect that in many of our lives, it'll get to the point where the railroads will say, we can run trains without anybody. We'll have a guy sitting in Jacksonville, Florida, behind a computer, and he'll be able to run the train, and uh, we won't need anybody running the train. Okay, the one question. Well, they, they may have given me the door, but I would probably need a semi truck to carry it home. It would have been that heavy. And the question was uh, on Canoe C2500, could I have taken that piece of metal that had the road number painted on it? And uh, I actually thought about that, but. Uh, you know, that would be very, very heavy, and it would be another piece of stuff cluttering up my uh, condo. Okay, thank you. So as Tara comes up and does our drawing, um, we pass the hat. I can't talk. I think maybe you better come up. <laughs> We passed a hat and did a collection. We came up with some money to make a down payment on a caboose if we could. So we might think we about that. Oh, is that it? <laughs> All right, the number one is uh, 